the hope that tomorrow really will be better. Because tomorrow uh, is with you in eternity. And so this is why you tell us that as long as it's called today, do not let our hearts be hardened. Let our hearts not be hardened this morning today. But let us grow soft towards you and soft towards the gospel and to the hope that we have in you, Jesus. That we might worship you as you deserve. Break up our concrete hearts. You've given us a heart. You've given us a, a, a home. You've given us a family. And, uh, and you've given us a hope. And because of that, you deserve all of our praise and our worship that, you, that we could possibly, possibly give you. Because you are worthy of it. And so, Father, I ask that you would use, uh, use me this morning to speak to us, that you would uh, refine our thinking, refine how we worship you today, um, re- worship you in this house, but also every day of our lives, for, for you deserve it. And so whatever I've prepared to, to, to say, Father, I pray that you would use that, that you would speak through me. If there are things that I have thought about and prepared to say that aren't from you, let, just help me not to say them. Or at least that we don't remember them. But the things that are from you, that, 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 that are true, may they be like a blazing fire burning away the scales off our eyes, breaking up our hearts, and transforming us to be the people who please you as we long to to be and that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Um, I hope you're enjoying this almost spring day. It's been gorgeous this week. You know what my favorite time of winter is? Spring. I don't like winter. <laughs> it's dark, but March 10th, mark it on your calendar, March 10th is coming. And that's when daylight savings occurs and everything is better with more light. <laughs> so, we are in Revelation 5. Um, Revelation 5. If you would like to turn there. William Shakespeare said, All the world is a stage. Men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. All the world's a stage. I think that's true. I think that's very true, actually. Um, it's, uh, he, he, obviously, the most, one of the most famous, if not the most fa- famous writers of all, his, of all time, certainly playwright, he was able to take Christian truth and just concisely say it in such a beautiful, descriptive way. And that's what we've been seeing as we've been going through this, this, these two chapters in Revelation, chapter 4, chapter 5. I could have titled today, um, Worship, Part 3. Um, I haven't re- re- labeled any of these worship something, but they could be. Chapter 4, ver- the first couple of verses here, chapter, well, most of chapter 4, we, we saw that worship is the thing that the highest order of all angels do all the time. And, we, and the lesson we can get out of that, if nothing else, is that the greatest purpose for our lives, the greatest, most fulfilling thing, the thing that we should be wanting to do, the greatest significance we could have for ourselves is to worship. It's the purpose of all people. It's what the old reformers said when they said that the chief end of man is to glorify God. That's all I'm saying. Glorify God. It's what you should be doing. And then we turned the page and went into chapter 5, and we said something really, frankly, quite simple here in the first half of chapter 5, is that worship is a spontaneous response to the gospel. 
That when you see Christ in all His greatness, verse 5, 6, in the context of our need, 1, and, one through 3, 4 particularly, that worship just happens. That when we see how needy we are, and that Christ has met that need by His death, Worship occurs. I mean, it's what Paul, and this isn't new. I mean, this is all over the place. This is just obvious stuff. It should be obvious. It's what Paul is saying when he says in, in, in Romans, the first half of Romans, particularly summarized in chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? Because of that, Christ died for us, and then he ends up this entire section going to chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, in view of God's mercies that he died for us while we were sinners. Let's worship. Offers to him worship. That's all this is. So chapter 4, worship is the one thing that all humanity, all created beings should be doing. Chapter 5, first half, and what particularly spurs us to worship is the death and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf obvious stuff, isn't it? And so I don't know whatever needs you have today. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're struggling with health stuff, if you're hurting with with um, financially or depression or worry. What I don't know what it is. But in the midst of you, whatever your needs are, if you can see Jesus high and exalted, that will help spur you to worship. And that's kind of where we're going to get to here now at this this, this rest of it. And I'm actually going to pause very, very much just in verse 9. I'm going to pull from a variety of places in this text, in verse 4 or 5 mostly, but for both texts, both passages. Because I want us to just pause a moment and really think a little bit more about what, how are we supposed to worship. Kind of a provocative title, isn't it? Entertaining God. You know, we throw that out, don't we, with worship? Oh, that worship is it. That, that worship service was entertainment. This worship service isn't entertainment. And we, we don't really even think for a moment what exactly is entertainment. So let's get a definition out there and think about it for a second. Entertainment is an activity designed or done by a performer or performers, to delight an audience. That's what entertainment is. Something that's being done by a, by, a, by a person or a group, performers, so that the audience is happy with it, enjoy it, they like it. But the question becomes, for worship service, a Sunday morning, who's the performers? And who's the audience? Is Joe the performer? And you're the audience? Is God the, the, the performer? And we're the audience? Or is God the audience? And we're all the performers? The first thing I want us to see this morning, and I could probably put, in fact, the whole sermon in together in just this phrase, and it's kind of a complicated phrase, and those of you who are taking notes could write this down. The worship is not about me but about him. It's not about me, it's about him. And therefore, it's about other people. Worship is not about me, it's about him, and therefore about others. Let's start about the first half, it's not about me. Just take a look very briefly, Just and you can see it all through here, but if you just look at verse 9, you can see it. And they sang a new song saying... Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals. For you were slain by your blood, and you ransomed people for God. And from every tribe and language and people and nation, I could keep going. And and 9, and verse 10, and you made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Turn over to chapter 4. Starting, look in verse 8. Holy and holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is to come. Verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. Who's the subject? Who are they talking to? 
It's so blindingly obvious, isn't it? That, it's, that God is the focus of this. Worthy are you. You were slain. You ransomed. Holy, holy are you. You created all things. You made them a kingdom of priests. You, you, you. They're talking to God. It's about him. He's the topic. He's the focus. The lamb is the focus. God is the focus. And if you keep going even all the way down to verse 14, excuse me, 13 and 14, look at 12. Well, we can start in 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, right? Verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory, might forever and ever. I mean, God is who it's all about. In fact, if it's not about God, it ain't worship. You could define worship in so many different ways. But a simple one is it's declaring the worth of someone or something. And that's what they're doing. It's so obvious, isn't it? But the problem is we, we, uh, we lose that focus. In practice, we, 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 we come to a worship service thinking it's about us. What well, I'm going to get out of it. And so we think about entertainment. This isn't entertainment for our benefit, but it is entertainment for God in the sense of there are performers worthy are you. They're singing. They're, they sang a song, right? That's a performer. But the audience is God. They're trying to please him. He's the one that they're wanting to make happy. He's the one that they're wanting to delight. They're talking to him. So when it's right, God is the audience. And we're the performers, not just Joe, all of us. And that means if we're doing that right, it makes no difference if there are lights or not lights. It makes no difference if there are snare drums or not snare drums. It makes no difference if there's an organ or a steel guitar. It makes no difference. That's not the issue. If God is one that's being pleased. Because we're not the ones who are trying to have a good time. We're trying to have God have a good time. The ultimate standard for worship is not how did that worship make you feel, but how did it make God feel? Was he the topic? Was he the focus? Joe often will say that he doesn't want to be a distraction. You've seen a lot of worship leaders modern, who will take their, their mic and they will put it right here. But Joe will not do that. And the reason why is because he does not want to be the center. It's not about Joe. He doesn't want to be a distraction. He says that. I don't want to be a distraction. And what he means by that is he does not want to be a distraction for you so that you would focus on God. He wants to facilitate it. And that's the issue. I mean, we do matter. I mean, those lights, in a sense, do matter. The type of snare drums and musicians do matter because it matters in does it help you worship? If it Does it distract? Does it take away? Does it cause you to not be able to focus on God? Well, that matters because he's the audience. Does it help us as performers, as, to continue the in analogy, be pleasing to God? Or does it detract? Does it encourage it or does it distract? Does it help or hinder us declaring the worth of God? That's the question. That's the only thing that matters. So whether we sing contemporary songs or out of the hymn book is not the issue. The issue is, is God happy? Can we worship? What helps us worship the most? Declare him the most. We can do the right things. And the, for the wrong reasons, though. Jesus talked about that all the time, didn't he? 
where, where those Pharisees would go around and they would pray, right thing, right? But for show, for wrong reasons. And so, that wasn't okay. We can come to church, right reason, right activity, but do it for the wrong reason. We can sing songs, right thing, but do it for the wrong reason, and then it's not okay. Are we doing it to please Jesus? Now, we're in this text here. You can see us there, right? I mean, for you ransomed people, that's us, right? From every tribe, language, and nation, you made them a kingdom of priests, and they... So it's not like songs can't talk about us. Of course they do. Or if you go back up to chapter 4, for you created all things, right? That's us. You can talk about us, but it's in the context of what he's done for us. It's just not, we're not the, men, the, the center of it. I mean, if you look at, if, 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 we, if nothing else, if we just kind of look at this pa- these pages here, four or five, Who's in the very middle of reality? It's not people. It's God. He's the one that we should be exalting. And my goodness, this should all be obvious. That we're not in the middle of everything. He is. So let's make him there. But if we do that, if we, as... as as it says here in chapter 5, when, he, when, when the elder turns to John and he says, Look, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of Judah has triumphed. So, so we, we, we need to look up. Which is why worship can be a really good antidepressant. Because sometimes we get so world and focused on the problems in our own lives and on, and, and on this horizontal level and we need to just Look up at the one who is the source of joy, the source of all goodness, source of all your peace, all your hope, all your strength. It's there. And so stop looking at me and look at him, he says. And when you focus on him, everything starts going into correct perspective. And so we we do get something out of worship. But that's that's kind of the the result. The the uh the what's the word? It's the byproduct. It's the byproduct. It's not the main point, but it does happen. It's like you praise God, you give you make God pleased and give him joy by praising his name, and he goes, And I'm gonna make you happy because you're making me happy. Isn't that how God works? It's more blessed to give. And he's the greatest giver there is. So that's the first page. And it's so obvious. And I realize this is kind of a weird sermon today. I normally go verse by verse by verse. But we, we need, there's some of these things we just, we got to hear. That worship and all of reality is not about you. It's not about us. It's about him. But second. It is an expression of love, though. If it's going to be about God, it has to be about other people. Look through this text here real quick. Do you see individuals there anywhere? Other than, of course, God. <laughs> there's, no, there's not individuals praising him. Look, look at verse... Look, going back to chapter 4, and it's the, it's the four living creatures who are saying, holy, holy, holy. Chapter, verse 9 the whole, and 10, it's the whole 24 elders are worshiping him, right? Then you come to chapter 5, verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down, and they, end up, and they start singing a new song and worshiping. It's a group. And then if you keep reading down here, I might as well read through it, verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the th- around the throne the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain 
In verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in it saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might and forever and ever. It's a group thing. It's not individual. It's group. And the point should be obvious. That worship can be done individually, but that's not norm. That's not the normative. Even if you go back to the Psalms, there are individual Psalms. But the predominant ones are group. It's the Lord's Prayer. How does that start again? Hmm. Our Father. Group. Group. We in America, in Western society in general, but really true in America, we are such an extreme individualist. So extreme. I mean, way off the chart in terms of human history. We think we live and die all to ourselves. And that is not true. We try. But it ain't true. And to be a Christian is to be a part of a group. I mean, look at verse, verse 9 again. Were there you to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people, multiples. You made them, verse 10, to be a kingdom and priests to our God. If you're a Christian today, you work, it means you have become part of a group, a nation, a kingdom. It's the whole point that John, uh, Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians. And if, it's that part where he's walking through, he's talking about like the Lord's Supper, where they're, they're, they're coming together and some of them are getting ill and some of them are getting sick and they're talking about this whole, um, that some of them are not, are being call, call, causing judgment to, call on, call, to, to, to get on themselves because they don't discern the body. Well, Paul defines the body. And he doesn't mean his, the physical body. Read through the text again. He's talking about the church. That whole emphasis all the way through there is that you need to be, realize you're a part of the church. You do not live alone. And what you do or don't do as a Christian affects others. You're a part of the church. In fact, it's anti-Christian. I'll even go so far as to say it's anti-Christian to not see yourself as part of the church. You may not like how the church acts. Fine. I don't either at times. Makes me annoyed and angry even how it treats people at times. Sure. But that's still Jesus' bride. And all of this has to do with worship. We're called to public group worship. It is not an accident that through the ages, Christians have come together to declare the praises of Jesus on Resurrection Day, Sunday. The group must take precedence. And so when he says in 1 Corinthians 10, this is, this is the general sense of what he, this is, the sense, this is the key thing that he's talking about through this entire section from 10, 11, 12, all the way through 14. That all things are lawful. You can do a lot of different stuff, sure, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Build up who? Verse 24? Is verse 24 in there? Yeah. Let us no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. See, we try to drive this wedge between loving God and loving people. And Jesus says, no, 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 you can't do that. Matthew 22, that whole, you know, the two greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And we go, yeah, that's right. And then the next one is to love people. You can't break it. You want to say you love God? Great. But if you hate people, God has a problem with that. It's not uh uh-uh. uh. You can't say I adore people, but people I just I adore God, but I just can't stand people. Nope. Mm-mm. 
And so to come into a worship service and say it's all about praising God, and yet at the same time you don't care about how what your actions are affecting everybody else, that's not okay. Uh-uh. We have, we have to think about others. And that's the point. As we, as Paul, and I wish I could take the time to slow down and walk through 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. It's this long conversation, this long issue that he's getting at about whatever is done in a worship service has got to be for the edification of everybody because we are part of a group. It's an act of, of love. So it's God's focused. He's the one that matters. But if it matters to him, if he's the one you're wanting to please, he says, what's going to please me is if you care about other people. Can't be entertainment. But it has to be a lifting up. You have to be aware of what your actions are doing for other people. So this is what it means to worship. And I realize this is a much shorter sermon than normal, but the summary is just worship is about him, not me. And if it's about him, it has to be about worshiping other people. Not worshiping other people. Oh God, forgive me of that. Forget about that. If it's about worshiping him, focus on him, that it means that you need to be aware of what you do or don't do in worship. Do you come to church thinking about yourself only? That's not okay. You have needs, absolutely. And 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 by and the amazing things is is when you come here with needs and your whatever it is, I have them. I have days today's a day. Sure. But it's about serving others. And if and the beautiful thing about the Christian faith is the way God has designed us is if if everybody thinks about everybody else, everybody's needs get met. Do you realize what you do or don't do affects everybody around you? Do you do you, do you understand that that when you miss church, we all suffer because you're not there. It's like if you chopped your hand off, you would miss your hand. If one of us isn't here, it's like we're missing a hand. That's Paul's point in that whole illustration of the body, that the church is a body, right? We miss you. Are you doing things that, that, that distract? And most of the time, that's not our problem. It's the other. Do you do things that are positively helping others to worship? Do you know if you're a wet blanket in worship, that affects people too? Do you realize, do you think about what matters in worship is how it made you feel? Or are you wondering how did God like the service today? Was he pleased with our worship? Was he pleased with how I loved people today? Was he pleased with with the way that we served each other? Are you acting in love? See, these are all questions we have to ask when it comes to the worship service. All of those matter far more than lights or type of songs or are you serving each other? Are you are you being a distraction or are you facilitating worship for each other? Because if he's not the only one that's the performer, but we all are, then that, that the, the very issue that he has is the same issue for all of us. Are you a distraction or are you a facilitator? And I realized, like I said, I normally walk through the text, but I just, I needed to pause here. Now, next week, I'm actually going to 
continue to pause for just one more week because there's another couple of things that we need to see in this text before we move on. I promise we will get back to the normal clip of going um, about five or six verses at a time, but, but we needed to hear this. And these should have all been obvious. I hope they were. But sometimes we need to hear the obvious. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. And I am very thankful for the, everyone who is here this day. They are an encouragement to me to see their smiley, smiles and, and get their hugs. And, um, and Lord, help, help us to be a blessing to each other, to please each other, to make them feel joy, because that, Lord, pleases you. to think about each other as an act of worship of you who alone deserves all glory and honor and praise. Help us to think biblically about worship, to see beyond the cultural norms of our day, whether it's traditional or contemporary, And to think like heaven does about it. Thank you again, Jesus, for the hope. In Christ's name, amen.